Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. I'm Deborah Cullinan. I'm the Vice President for the Arts at Stanford University, and I'm so pleased to be here with all of you uh, to moderate tonight's program, Transforming the Arts, What's New in the Bay Area. As Anne said, this is a special program to commemorate Women's History Month um, here at the Commonwealth Club, but to celebrate uh, women who have led the arts in San Francisco and will continue to lead the arts in San Francisco, which is so exciting. It's an honor for me to be sitting with these amazing human beings. So um, I am going to share with you more about each one of them and that alone is an honor and will be spectacular. So, and then we're gonna get into a conversation and as Anne said, we'll have some questions at the end. So to introduce our panelists, uh, Jessica Bejarano, founder and music director of the San Francisco Philharmonic, assistant conductor of Opera Parallel, and serves as board member of the Association of California Symphony Orchestras, ACSO, in 2019, Jessica was featured on NBC's, NBC's The Today Show with Natalie Morales as the woman breaking barriers as a trailblazing symphony conductor. Yeah, we can do a little bit of that. There's more. Do, just know there's more. Uh, PBS NewsHour Weekend also featured Jessica as an emerging female conductor. KQED named Jessica one of 10 artists to watch in KQED's Arts Br Bay Brilliant Top 10 Artists. Jessica was featured on ABC's hit show, To Tell the Truth. Oh. Yeah, I mean, come on. And, and it's, a, it's, yeah. And in addition, uh, Lil Libros, the book company, is excited to announce that they will publish Jessica's first bilingual children's book in the winter of 2024. <laughs> Jessica is the first woman in history to guest conduct the American Youth Symphony in Los Angeles and was one of 12 female conductors selected from around the world to conduct at the International Women's Conference in New York City. Jessica has guest conducted in Russia, Italy, Romania, Bulgaria, Spain, the Czech Republic, and Venezuela. Uh, Jessica earned her Master of Arts in Orchestral and Choral Conducting from UC Davis, Bachelor of Music and Music Education from the University of Wyoming, and Associates of Fine Arts from Casper College. Welcome, Jessica. Ooh. That was fun. <laughs> um, Priscilla, Priscilla Otani is board president of the Northern California Women's Caucus for the Art, for Art, NCWCA, founding partner of ARC Studios and Gallery in San Francisco, an art curator and an inter interdisciplinary artist. Founded in 1973, NCWCA has an activist mission in support of women in the arts, and its membership includes artists, art historians, curators, gallerists, arts educators, and students. As newly elected board president, Otani prioritizes the continuation of NCWCA's successful programs, such as the mentorship program, curatorial tours, activist ex exhibitions, and professional de development, as well as building collaborative opportunities with Bay Area businesses. As partner of ARC Studios and Gallery, Otani has focused on showcasing and promoting emerging and established artists in the San Francisco Bay Area. Since 2010, ARC has exhibited more than 500 mostly local artists, provides studio space for 14 local artists, and houses two micro-businesses. As curator, Otani has produced local, national, and international exhibitions through Art Gallery, the National Women's Caucus for the Arts, and the Pacific Center for, for the Book Arts. As an interdisciplinary artist, she's participated in many activist-themed exhibitions, ranging in subject matter from immigration, reproductive rights, women's rights, to politics. Otani received her BA in Psychology and Asian Studies from Mill Co Mills College in 1974, and her MA in Japanese Literature for, from Columbia University in 1976. Born in Tokyo, Otani is a bicultural, naturalized United States citizen. Welcome, Priscilla. <laughs> and 
And a very warm welcome to uh, Tamara Rojo, who is new to us here in the Bay Area. We're thrilled about that. Um, a celebrated leader and award-winning principal dancer who is appointed artistic director of the San Francisco Ballet in January 2022. Prior to this appointment, she served as artistic director and lead principal of London's national, English National Ballet, ENB, for nine and a half years, where she implemented groundbreaking programming, garnered the company accolades, and spearheaded a successful 50 million pound capital campaign to create a new headquarters for the company, which opened in 2019. Rojo has a depth of experience through her 30 year career as a professional ballerina. Prior to her directorship at ENB, she was a principal dancer at the Royal Ballet for over a decade, following a role as a principal at ENB in the late 1990s. Her acclaimed dance repertoire includes lead roles in all full-length ballet classics, as well as works by Balanchine, Robbins, Macmillan, and more. Raised in Madrid, Rojo received her bachelor's degree in dance choreography at the Real Conservatorio de Danza Mariama and received a master's in theatrical arts, as well as a doctorate from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos de Madrid. She's received Spain's three highest honors, although I think I count more, so, but many <laughs> honors, um, including the Gold Medal of Fine Arts 2002, Prince of Asturias Arts Award 2005, um, Encomienda de Numero Queen Isabel La Catalotica 2011, the Kennedy Center Gold Medal for Fine Arts 2012, the Order of the British Empire uh, for Distinguished Services to Ballet in 2016, two Olivier Awards, one for New Best Dance production in 2010 for the Brandstrap Rojo Project, and one for Best Achievement in Dance in 2017 for ENB's Repertoire. Rojo is also a 2021 Dance Magazine Award honoree. Wow. Welcome. <laughs> And last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, Danielle St. Germain was recently appointed executive director at San Francisco Ballet. With nearly 25 years of management, fundraising, and marketing experience, Danielle is a dynamic leader in the nonprofit arts industry. She has led notable fundraising teams across the United States, including as associate director of development at Shakespeare Theater Company, vice president of institutional advancement, at the American Association of Museums and Chief Development Officer at Arena Stage, all in Washington, DC, and Director of Development at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. She's achieved notable success with the annual fund, critical relief, and capital campaigns, raising more than $400 million to date. And I bet that's probably not even where we are today. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a graduate of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, St. Germain returned to California when she joined SF Ballet in 2018 as Chief Development Officer. Welcome. Thank you. So I want to just dive in, and I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions. And I think what I'll do is go down the line back. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on you to keep things moving. Okay. Um, so uh, the first question I wanted to ask, just, just kind of, you know, the thing that many of us, uh, you know, continue to say, try to grasp, try to reflect on is these past several years. Um, the pandemic, racial uprising, climate change, social movement, so many things. And these things have challenged the arts ecosystem to adapt and transform from attendance to programming to promoting and, and engaging with audiences in a more digital and different world. So what I'd love to hear to get us started is what's changed for your organization um, or you and what has changed for you as a leader of your organization. Um, and we'll start in this direction. Yay, all right. Um, interesting that you're gonna start with me because when I founded the San Francisco Philharmonic, it was right before the pandemic. Um, I was actually flying back from Bulgaria and I had this idea of like, you know, I'm gonna create my own orchestra. I'm gonna create an orchestra that for me is truly inclusive that, you know, from, from the board of directors to the musicians to the audience, something different, something unique, something very special. I'm gonna create my own and got off the plane and, you know, started working on building the board, building the idea. And that was August, and by February 2020, we were at the Herbst Theater for our inaugural performance. 
We sold out the house. The orchestra was about 65 musicians, um, and it was just an incredible performance, an incredible energy, an incredible, you know, coming out of the gates with the San Francisco Philharmonic, and we were just like, oh my God, here we go, this is gonna work. And as we know, a month later, womp womp, you know, like everything was shut down, and it was just this feeling of like, oh my God, like, is this, is this for real? Is this really happening? So for us, the Philharmonic, you know, we had one an amazing concert under our belts. So we used this time actually to, you know, um, to have the board meet and to formulate, you know, like, okay, what's our next move? Let's fundraise. Let's, you know, fine tune what worked, what didn't work. Um, because when we come back out, because we will come back out, um, what's what's our next plan? What's our next step? What's our next program? And how are we going to keep the momentum of this incredible organization alive? Mm -hmm. um, so for us, for us, it was quite different. Um, but it, that. That, that downtime, we looked at it as a positive opportunity to, to strategize and, and keep this organization moving. So quite different for us, and that's my story for, for, for that question. Excellent. Excellent. Priscilla? I still remember our last in-person meeting in March where we were folding a gigantic crane on the floor to be taken to a march in Washington called Solidarity Tsuru Solidarity for a friend of ours who happens to be part of the membership. And that happened to be the last time that we actually had a physical meeting of our organization. Um, in April, we decided to plan for what to do now that you know everything was closed. And luckily, we had just purchased Zoom. And starting in May, we went back to our usual programming. We had our meetings on Zoom. What it un unexpectedly produced was a lot more people attending and participating because we have membership through, spread throughout California and even members from out of state start to join in, even from other countries, because I think right away people were seeking community. And we were not only able to carry on our monthly meetings, but we carry on our, our activities. We have this big event called the Bay Area Art Stars. And first, you know, first time ever, we figured out how to use breakout rooms. And we just went <laughs> right on with exactly what we were going to do and have all the art stars meet with all the people who wanted to, to get to know them. And that was great. We had a four-hour year-end party on Zoom. Uh -huh. And we had all these activities, and people were allowed to come in and out of those hours, and everybody stayed. We had a mass gift exchange where people, you know, exchanged gifts before the meetup, and then at the meetup, we all opened the gifts at the same time. Mm. And everybody was so excited. And not only that, we came up with a great concept at that particular party that we have carried on called the, um, the table setting project, where artists were asked to create a table setting of who they are as an artist. It was sort of based on Judy Chicago's idea, but everybody got so inspired. And from that sort of online showing of our table settings, we ended up doing a lot of online exhibitions related to that. So, you know, we unexpectedly grew based on activities and events that we were able to improvise. And thank God for technology, because that enabled us to survive. And then after a period, like 2020 was similar that way, but in 2022, we're back to starting to do certain events in person. Like we did, we do our land art day where members are allowed to go to a piece of property and create land art. So that sort of activity got revived again. Mm -hmm. And so we brought back things that we could, that we felt were safe, but we also kept activities like our monthly meetings on Zoom because we found that we reach a wider audience. So for us, it was a, a time of innovation and growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Tamara, I know for you, this is a question in the midst of transition, so. Yeah. I, I guess, yeah, precisely because I'm in the midst of that, I'm, perhaps I can't answer in such detail, but a more broader yeah. um, thought, which is that for ballet as a performing art, nothing and everything has changed. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is that I think the pandemic for the first time in a long time, uh, made us question our place in society. Mm -hmm. And very often we hear the ballet is elitist or the ballet is this or the ballet is that. Or, um, and I think myself, I started to teach from my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I had two million people turn up every day to do ballet class with me mm -hmm. from all over the world. Mm -hmm. From Japan, from Brazil, they will set up their alarms at 3 a.m. in the morning because of what it meant to them to have this meditative process mm -hmm. of doing body class, 
of finding their own body and, and coming to terms with the isolation in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that made me my question again, not my commitment to, to, to what ballet can do for the community and what I, an instrument performing arts, not just ballet can be, um, but how do we implement that in the everyday running of institutions? Yeah. And I think that's where we are now, is that, and that's what I mean by everything and nothing, in that what we believe we are or what our place in society or the importance of the art, for me, has increased. Yeah. Um, I, I believe more than ever that through the arts we can have a positive, lasting impact in society, that we can be part of the um, social mobility in society, we can really give opportunities to people of any backgrounds to have a dignified, even wealthy, successful, however you want to brain it, meaningful life um, as part of our culture and society. Mm -hmm. But the business model, the institutions have take longer to change. And so we've, ta we've taken all this meaning and we're trying to implement it into a floor plan that is still almost, you know, it's the same for a hundred years. Yeah, and that's and that's I think where we are now facing ourselves is that we know what we can be and we know what we're supposed to be and we know that society wants us to be that, and yet our structures demand that we do so many other things in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that philosophical question is done where we grapple. And all of that at the time, at the same time while managing a group of artists, especially the dancers that are very young and they're very in tune with society, with the very important conversations that we're having about lots of issues that are not necessarily easy to implement in an art form that is hundreds of years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're in a, in a time of huge change and essential, and, and at the same time, the storm of AI mm -hmm. and what it means for artists. So <laughs> I, I think we're in the eye of the, of the storm. <laughs> uh, we've gone through pandemic, we're breathing, but now we need to go through the other side of the tornado yeah. and, and find out what, what is left. Yeah, beautiful. Sorry. Beautiful, yeah, Danielle. Uh, so March 6th, 2020 was when we were performing, and I remember it as uh, clear as day. I kind of forget the three years between March 6th and today, though. They <laughs> tend to blur together, which is so strange. And on that night, March 6th, we had an incredible dinner at the uh, Botanical Gardens in Golden Gate Park. And it was this magical, all in celebration of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And so as we're at this dinner, we had heard, of course, the news, this thing happening, kind of, and we're like, oh, no, no, there's not a problem here. Come have dinner. So we have this fabulous <laughs> gathering. And um, uh, that our then executive director and I were getting text messages. And I said, you know, excuse me for a moment, go back and, and say, you know, have you heard from the mayor? And I was like, oh God, I'm just not gonna look at my phone because we have this incredible dinner and opening night tonight and Sasha DeSola is dancing in a couple hours. So, or actually it wasn't Sasha, she was at my table. Anyway, um, fast forward, uh, we got word actually at intermission, during intermission, that we were being shut down, that we could perform that evening and it was time to go home and we'll figure it out later. Uh, and from there, there was this weird moment, I'm sure, we, I think everybody would agree, um, that for a minute was kind of a novelty. We're like, wait, we're not going to work? Like, oh, this is kind of fun. And actually up until May of 2020, which is a mile marker in, in, in for all the reasons. Um, I, I remember we had, with, everything was on Zoom, which was a new technology for us, go figure. And we had our, our Fridays to keep kind of spirits up. It was called uh, Fancy Friday. So when you'd be in your meetings, you'd be a little dressy from the waist up because people were at that point prone to not dressy on Zoom <laughs> um, from the waist up or wherever. Uh, and then May 20th, and that was you know this is long, long overdue for all the societal reckoning moment. Um, murderous moment. And so all, all things changed. Just absolutely everything changed. And uh, as, as Tamara mentioned, our dancers are young, our dancers are physical, our dancers were trapped 
in their homes. And I think we all know that apartments in general in San Francisco are not large. And uh, ballet dancers uh, kind of wingspan, right? <laughs> it is large. And it was so, so incredibly hard. And we were um, really proud of the incredible team at the ballet in that we were truly working with our peers to be forefront with COVID precautions, getting the OK, getting the studios open, getting the dancers back in, separating them into small groups. COVID testing to the tune of millions of dollars of COVID testing and keeping people safe. It was about keeping them physically safe, keeping them emotionally and psychologically safe and being as supportive as we could. Our incredible musicians would do concerts in driveways. And I remember at that moment, I was like, I'm going to stand um, upwind because we, we didn't really know how you, how you would really get COVID actually. Uh, so all to say, uh, we were then back in the opera house in for Nutcracker, I guess it was 20, all the 21, it's just 21, correct? Yes, 21. Uh, and we had our digital season. We were able to pivot uh, very quickly, again, to the creativity of the team we have at the ballet and truly the incredible support from the government um, here of the city government in San Francisco and the mayor. Um, and the digital season was great. People enjoyed it. They figured it out. And then uh, we started messaging because we all know it to be true that, that nothing competes with live. There is nothing better than that communal, that communal gathering where what you see on that stage will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. And that's the thrill and the excitement and the danger and the joy. Um, and so here we are in our 90th season. Uh, we had our highest grossing money-wise ballet in our 90-year history this past December with Nutcracker. So there's proof that people want to be... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think your first day was December 5th. Yeah. Uh, and it's so, so Nutcracker, we've been doing this production, I think 18 years, 18 years. Uh, and it's magical. I'm sure you have all seen it. And if not, you're coming back this December. Uh, and every single person I talked to said, you know, A, we love Helgi's Nutcracker. And it's all so different now with Tamara here. And so there's this spirit. I know, and I was like, well, actually, it's not. However, <laughs> there is an energy and an excitement and all to say it feels so good to be back and for our dancers to be in our orchestra members to be back in front of our audiences. So, so far, so good. Excellent. Excellent. So I, I just want to pull out a few things because, you know, as we have these conversations, I think many of us are taken right to that moment and, and, and that realization of like, wow, what we've been through what we still don't know and understand. So in the, in the uh, just a few things, in the early days um, of the pandemic, the writer Arundhati Roy published a piece called The Pandemic is, a Portal, is the Portal. And speaking to Tamara's uh, point, what, what she was saying is that we are at a precipice and we have a choice and we can either move through that portal as heavy and as burdened with all of the things, the hatred, the racism, you know, all of those things, and we can bring them with us, or we can move ever so lightly through that portal so that when we get to the other side, we can invent anew. And when I hear you all speaking, I hear people who really did say we need to think differently. This is not a return, it's a reimagination. Um, the other thing that I was reminded of uh, was um, I was I was on the phone on a walk in the rain in San Francisco with the choreographer Liz Lehrman, and Liz was reminding me um, of work that she had done with seniors around falling, and this idea that we may not realize it, but if we are able to be mindful about it, we are at our most inventive when we are falling, and so these two things, this sort of idea that we are still falling. And we have the choice to be inventive. And so I think really inspired by that. And then the last thing I'll pull out before we ask some more questions is I do believe, as I think all of you said in one way or another, at least in my career, I have not experienced a time when more people understand that art is essential. This is a moment. They may not know what it means, but they do understand that it's essential and it's our jobs to show them how we think about art as a part of the infrastructure of our lives. So I feel like that's something we can seize on as we continue the conversation. So I wanna ask the next uh, two questions, but I'm gonna ask them together. So the first one is, what are you most proud of? And the second one is, what challenges have you encountered 
in terms of gender equity in your field. So I'll start at the other end, since oh, Daniel great. just- Oh, yeah. uh, The proud one is really easy. Oh, okay, I'll start. So um, apparently I'm, I'm good with dates. So uh, March 6th, lose everything, kind of. Um, March 25th, I remember um, we did a kind of back of napkin calculation at the ballet of, uh-oh, we're losing so much, like the kind of the biggest shows of the season, actually. And what will it mean? And we kind of figured out, it's probably like $10 million. I remember being in the room, Zoom room, um, with finance, with our wonderful CFO, Rob Four, And I was like, you know, I think, I think development can probably do this like critical relief campaign thing. And I think we can, I think we can raise $5 million. So he's like, great. I said, I think we can do it. By June 30th, that's cool. So we have this, so the Crit Critical Relief Fund was born on this fabulous platform. And then we realized you could order masks. And we were, I think, the first to mass order masks when you could use cloth masks, because now you can't use them. Uh, but cloth masks were, were fine. Uh, and we raised, um, as we promised, $5 million. However, I'm not proud that it was not by June 30th. It was by July the 6th. And that <laughs> will bother me until the day I leave this planet. <laughs> However, I'm so proud because that was where every single person did every single thing they could. We had people building teams online to fundraise, concerts and driveways by our musicians, P dancers making um, email thank yous, to, uh, videos. It was absolute magic. So that was great. And in terms of gender, in terms of my career with gender, this is going to sound really strange, but I'll say it. Um, I am really tall. And this has nothing to do with gender. I'm just really tall. And I have found in my career that it has probably, it appears to have been easier for me than colleagues of mine kind of coming up in my era because of just, I think, how I can walk into a room. Or maybe it could be intimidating. I don't, I don't think it is, but maybe. And so that's just been an interesting thing. So, as, as I, so it's not really answering your question, but that's something that I feel I had an easier go of mm -hmm. than um, others may have. I mean, I think it does answer the question in, okay. in, in a way, right? Because it's, it's, it's the way in which we're expected to walk into a room or to let go of who we are to all of those things. So I think, you know, it, it'll be great to hear, to hear people pick up at it. And I'm five two. And, um, I learned also very young that I should be appear to be taller. So I always wore heels and also that it really mattered that you show up kind of large. So, I mean, at least in my experience. So that's very interesting. I think I got the high heel memo because I always wear three inch heels. Go figure. <laughs> and it's not to be yeah. taller. It's no. Comfortable. Yeah. yeah. The, okay. There is that. Yeah. Tam Tamara, do you want to go? Um, yep. So, um, what I'm more proud of is similar, but of course, in the context of the UK. Uh, A, that from the first day, um, I was able to help people and dancers keep their minds sane and, and their bodies sane. Uh, by teaching from my kitchen. We also uh, made sure that we share floor with all our dancers so that they could practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just keeping, keeping people, keeping dancers mainly motivated every day, um, you know, keeping them having a routine, keeping them creating networks where they can connect with each other. Mm -hmm. But also I was very involved in lobbying in the UK. And so I was directly involved in the rescue package for the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, we got 1.9 billion mm -hmm. pounds from the UK government and that saved every single uh, institution. So, so everybody was saved. Mm -hmm. After the pandemic and with Brexit, no, <laughs> some of those people are now folding. But throughout the pandemic and for the first year, 5,000, I think, institutions received funding from the government, so everybody was saved. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, in terms of gender, I think I was never aware that it was an issue, mm. other than I'm inside my own industry, that what I find is that there's a lack of historic memory, mm. because there's a lot of statements about directors being male, but if you look back, especially in the UK, the top companies in the UK, Rumber, English National Ballet, Royal Ballet, were all funded by women and directed by women for decades. Mm -hmm. um, National Ballet of Canada was there. So, so it's almost like the industry forgot 
for about right. 50 years after them, and it was only men. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I have found is that within the artistic director circles, is true that is more collaborative among men. Mm -hmm. So men collaborate with each other. They call each other for co-production opportunities more often. They tell each other what the plans are. I have to actively mm -hmm. search that. Mm -hmm. So they are like, there's like a club within a club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yep. Yeah. Priscilla. Okay. Um, I grew up in Japan, so being five foot two was not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I felt perfectly on standard. And, and so coming here, I didn't realize it was a bit of a problem. But anyway, this is quite industry. Um, I would say that I'm most proud of the fact that my organization has been growing 20% a year, that we have a very strong, diverse board that brings all kinds of tools to the table, and these are all volunteers that I'm talking about. I'm also proud of the fact that we have a relatively flat organization. You know, we have a monthly meeting that's open to everybody, and a lot of the innovations and great ideas bubble up from within the membership. It's not a top-down organization where we drive down what we think should happen within us. And I really love that because that means that we get to do so much more. You know, it's not just one person having to do a lot of heavy lifting. Um, but in terms of gender issues, I see that a great deal in, still in the women in the arts. I find, one, it's very hard to nurture ambition in women, for women to self-promote themselves, to get out there and um, fail, you know, go out there and apply for things and fail and be okay with it and pick yourself up. So I do think there's a lot of work to be done around ambition. I also feel that in the marketplace, there's still much more room for growth. I mean, there are very few you know, women directors in museums. Very few women's artwork even come close. I mean, they're a fraction of what it is in the auction houses. I mean, there are so many things that we still need to do in academia to bring tenured women, presidents, um, those kinds of things up. And so I feel like there's a lot more work to be done. At the same time, I'm very proud of the fact that our chapter you know, practices contemporary feminism, which is a lot more than just protest, although protest is still part of what we do, but focusing on issues mm -hmm. that affect women. Everything from college debt to um, you know, getting, getting a job in the arts field to you know, balancing motherhood and, and art, all those things. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Jessica. Yes, um, I'm going to start with the challenges and then go nice. into... Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was uh, in grad school, um, my professor, we would have weekly uh, conducting sessions, score study sessions, and one day he just stopped and rolled back in his chair and crossed his arms and he asked me, are you serious? And I was like, serious about what? He goes, are you serious? And I was confused. I was like, I I'm sorry, what are you talking about? He goes, are you serious about being a conductor? And I was like, absolutely, I'm dedicated, I'm passionate, I want this, yes. Then he proceeded to say, well then go back to your country because it's not gonna happen in mine. Mm. Oh. And I oh. thought oh. it was a oh. joke and then he carried on with get the F out of my office. <gasps> oh. And I was just appalled, absolutely appalled. And I remember I didn't even finish my classes for the rest of the day. I went home and I stared at a wall for I don't know how many hours thinking, if this is the way academia is gonna treat me, what's the real world gonna treat me like? Mm -hmm. You know, as a woman, you know, a Mexican woman wanting to become a conductor. And so I was just like, this is too much. It's too difficult, it's too hard. But then at the same time, I was like, no, this is my life. This is my passion. This is, this is what I want. And I'm not gonna let him or anyone take it away. So I had to learn right there how to take a negative and turn it into a positive, how to take a no and turn it into a yes, how to take negative energy and use it to catapult me even further than I thought I can go. So I graduate from, from you know, my master's program and I get my first position with an orchestra here in the Bay Area. And right before the concert, I conduct the opening piece. Um, I walked off the stage into the audience to say hello to my friends that came to see me conduct. And there's ushers at either side of the stage guarding the, the stairs. And once I was done saying hello to my friends, I was walking back um, on stage by the stairs uh, to get ready to start the concert. And the usher says, excuse me, no, you can't go back there. And I was like, I'm, I'm with the orchestra. No, 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 you can't go back there to any of the musicians. I was like, but I am the musicians. I'm the assistant conductor. I'm going to start the show. 
ma'am, if you don't leave, we're gonna escort you out of the building. I was just oh, like, oh my oh, God, no, I belong. Oh, oh. I belong, oh, I, 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 oh I'm with gosh. the orchestra, you know? She's like, ma'am, I'm gonna call security. And I was just like, oh dear God. And so I walked back to my friends and I was like, quick, someone give me a program book. Someone give me a program book. And, and I walked back to the usher and I opened it up to page five where it had Jessica Bejarano, my headshot and my bio assistant conductor. And she's like, oh, okay, okay, come on. You know, and so you know, I had to prove that I belong, you know, cause it's, it's like, of course she can't be the assistant conductor. Of course she doesn't belong with this orchestra. Of course, you know, she's a woman. She, she's, not, she's not a conductor, she's not, no. So it was it was uh, it was very interesting, um, and you know one of my other experiences uh, was not necessarily directed towards me, but I think it was in a sort of passive way. <laughs> I was at a conducting uh, master class in Europe, and I'm not going to say what country. Um, and they accepted 20 conductors from around the world. 15 were male, five of us were female. And um, in the mornings, we would conduct for the master maestro. He would sit in a chair. And then the conductor would stand up and conduct for the maestro and he would fix, you know, posture, baton, uh, whatever. And the rest of us would sit in a line and we would listen because you listen from watching other conductors and what the maestro has to say. And so one of the female conductors came up and as soon as uh, she got up, you know, it was her turn, the maestro said, ah, Svetlana, out of all the female conductors here, you are the most beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Let me show you how to use your beauty to extract the most out of the orchestra. Oh. <laughs> wow. No joke. Oh and my gosh. me and the other female conductors were just like, oh. <laughs> it was just incredible how they view women, and, and you know, it's just like I don't think they would ever tell a man that, you know. So it was just, it was just really wild, and I just couldn't believe wow. it, you know. But for me, I just learned like, okay, take the pearls of wisdom and, and leave this sort of stuff behind. It, it, be, it became part of you know my story, my experience. Just so unfortunate. Um, you know, here in this country, orchestras are tiered, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three. September 27, 2007, I will never forget that date, Marin Ossop was given the music director position with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, making her the first female in the history of this country to conduct a tier one orchestra. So now, I think it was this year, last year, we had Natalie Stoltzman um, named uh, music director of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, which is also a tier one orchestra, making her the second, but at the same time, Marin Ossop left to go conduct in Vienna. So Natalie Stoltzman is the only one still. So there's only one female conductor in this country that conducts a tier one orchestra. You know, and, and it's just like, the, yeah, there's one, you know, we got one, but it, no, one's not enough. You know, it needs to be balanced because there's 25 top tier orchestras. Out of 25, one female is not enough. It's absolutely not enough. What am I most proud of? Yeah. After all the things that I've been through, you know, um, I, I, this is part of the reason why I built the San Francisco Philharmonic, you know? It's really, um, you know, difficult for women to, to be given a place on a podium, to be given opportunity. So I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna create my own opportunity and I'm gonna make it happen. And I did, you know, and, and during the pandemic too, you know, I created the San Francisco Philharmonic and my board of directors are absolutely diverse in any and every way imaginable. My orchestra, the musicians, you go look at them. They're a very eclectic group of musicians. And my audience, when you go into one of my concerts, you are welcomed, you feel comfortable, you feel like you belong, whether it's your first time at a symphony concert or the hundredth time at a symphony concert. I invite and make sure that these people are, are coming into the concert hall, not by hoping and wishing, but I go out there and I partner with schools and I get those kids into the concert hall. You know, I go with the, find the drag queens and I get the drag queens into the concert hall. You know, I work with, you know, veterans and give veterans special discounts. You know, I work with the elderly and, and call their, you know, um, living assisted homes, you know, and, and you know, organize, um, you know, rides, charters for them to get into the concert hall as well. I go find the diversity and bring it into the concert hall. Um, and what we're also doing this year with the San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. What we're also doing with the San Francisco Philharmonic that I don't think has ever been done here in, in, um, in the, the state um, in San Francisco, but we're doing the first ever uh, international conducting masterclass where we're inviting 20 um, conductors from around the world to work with the master maestro, Donald Schleicher, um, and uh, conduct the San Francisco Philharmonic for an entire week, giving these students an opportunity to conduct an orchestra and get experience to help catapult their careers. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the workshop that I went 
one, two, 20 conductors, 15 are male, five are female. I'm making sure that at this workshop, it's 50-50, that it's really diverse. Mm -hmm. so, so good. <laughs> So I'm really proud of the, of the fact that, I, that I've been able to persevere through everything that I've been through and that I've been able to create um, the San Francisco Philharmonic. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, please. Can I add something? Because I forgot something. I don't know why I forgot. <laughs> but talking about gender, um, when I took over the director of English National Ballet, I had been a dancer for 20 years. And I suddenly realized I had not danced a single piece choreographed by a woman mm. in my entire career. And in fact, it took the Royal Ballet 21 years to commission a woman mm -hmm. to choreograph. So while I was artistic director of EMB, I made sure that I commissioned plenty of women. We ended up commissioning 40 women in nine years mm -hmm. to create work. And I just found out that next season, which we haven't announced yet, which will be my first season, but we are going to commission a full length by a woman, and it will be the first time in the history of San Francisco Ballet that a woman will be a full length. So that's, that's good. Oh. I'm so glad that you remembered that. To yes. us about. <laughs> so I, I want to just remind people, if you do have questions, use the cards and, and send them up so we can try to, to get to some of them at least. Um, and the good news is a, a few of the ones that have already come in uh, ha relate to a question that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to try to put it all together into one. So um, the question that I was going to ask is, what do you recommend to future women leaders in the arts? Um, our audience would like to know um, a couple things, so I'll just put these all out there and take it take it as you can. Um, what messages or advice can you can we give students who want to pursue a life as a professional in the arts? And then, do you have thoughts or ideas around how we keep the arts relevant to younger generations? So, a series of questions about younger people and how we uh, encourage people to pursue careers. Yeah. How about if we mix it up and we'll start with Priscilla? OK. <laughs> Just keeping you on your toes. Well, one of the new programs that we introduced, thank you, thanks to Sawyer Rose, who's sitting in the audience, is something called the Bay Area Art Stars. And what we try to do is we, we try to connect with women in the fine arts professions. So it's everything from being an artist to a curator to a museum curator to a professor, any sort of successful arts career. And we have them come in as what we call art stars and we invite MFA students and we invite our members to come and speed date these women. Sort of. So what we have these is these big round tables, and we have one art star at each one. And the um, invited guests can ask any questions they want um, with these invited women. And it's been very good because it gives the audience, and particularly MFAs, who may not know exactly what to do with their MFAs, and are probably staring down a huge college debt after they get their degrees, some idea of, of what these successes in the arts look like. And they can actually interface with these women who may sometimes feel very distant from them. Like, how do you meet these people? Right. Um, and on top of that, the women who serve as art stars love it even more than the students who actually get to sit around them because it is so rare for somebody who's successful in the arts to actually be appreciated. You know, to know that there are people that adore and admire them and think what they're doing is so important. And so that's one of the programs that we, we've launched that's been very successful. And at the same time, we introduce our mentoring program at the same meeting. So we give out cards and we have people sign up to be mentees um, and our members then sign up to be mentors. Mm. And the mentees are asked a series of questions and they have to have specific needs for like a six month mentee project. And then what we do is we pair up the mentees with the mentors and they get to have that one-on-one -on -one opportunity again to sort of help them figure out like, well, how do I apply for the next level of education or how do I apply for a residency or how do I approach a gallery? I mean, all those kinds of things that people who are just about to leave the universities want to know about. Um, and the reason why we're focusing on that is we found out that there wasn't an organization that provided this sort of safety net after people leave their academic environment. Mm -hmm. And we felt we could fill that gap. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, wonderful. Danielle, do you want to jump in? Um, yes. 
So um, my starting with when you're no longer the young person trying to find your career in the arts, when you're the person who has a career in the arts, my advice is to always um, accept meetings with anybody, well, almost anybody who asks for time, the kind of mentor-mentee thing. I think it's really, really important. Uh, so sometimes it takes a little longer to make it happen because uh, these are busy times, but I think it's really, really important to extend that generosity. And then my advice, if I guess this advice, uh, whenever I always say it's the, a career in the arts is like you have to climb a ladder. And if you have a ladder in front of you, you can't just jump to the top rung and, and hold on. What you need to do is grab onto every single rung and make your way to, you know, towards the top of the ladder. And um, my career, I was um, 30, actually. I was 30 when I decided to have a career in, in the arts. I had done um, some things political prior. And um, I actually called... Uh, I was a subscriber, I'll be quick, subscriber to the Shakespeare Theater in DC. I had a terrible fundraising call where they said my name wrong, they were eating on the phone, it was that horrible delay. And so I basically said to my then uh, future ex-husband, um, I said, um, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't even married yet, go figure. Um, and I said, I'm gonna go knock on the door of the Shakespeare Theater and I'm, I, I'm gonna go solve that problem for them. So I basically knocked on the door and said, you have a liability somewhere in this building and you should hire me to fix it. And so they were like, oh great, you know, it's $13 an hour. I'm like, no, no, I'm an adult, I'm 30 years old. What are you talking so fast forward I went on to spend eight years there and raise I think it was 89 million dollars for their campaign um, which is a miracle because it's just but also it is um, squeaky wheel gets the grease uh, if you uh, no doesn't mean no it means not now and you have to do absolutely every role so when you can lead your teams you can say actually you know I, I will look an envelope I will print a thing of course and um, in a career in the arts is really really fulfilling and it's also um, not for the faint-hearted because tomorrow knows, we all know, it doesn't end at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. It is a round the clock thing, but um, I can't imagine anything better. It's beautiful, yeah. Tamara, do you wanna add anything? Yes, I think in my experience, going back to the choreographers, when I first started trying to commission women, very often they lack courage. They will say to me, I'm not ready, this company is too important, it's too prominent, I think I need a step before this. I never had the answer from any man. I had completely unqualified gentlemen. <laughs> not only ready to take an offer, but actually actively creating their own offers. <laughs> yeah. And I never found, so I will say to women in the arts, jump, yeah. mm -hmm. take courage. If somebody's offering you something, don't wait until you're completely ready and you've studied everything and you've done all the research. No, you learn. Just take the opportunity. If somebody's coming to you, it's because you're good enough. Right. And if they're not coming to you, go find them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I would say, just, just jump. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good, yes. Do you wanna bring that one home? Yes, uh, so uh, you know it, it, what you said really resonates with what I'm gonna say. Uh, when I was an, an undergrad, you know, I was a music education major. I thought I was gonna be a professor or a high school teacher somewhere. Then I had to take a class uh, of uh, conducting and I fell in love with the art of conducting and I realized at that point like, ah, I wanna be a conductor, just like that. You know, why not? <laughs> I didn't do the research, you know, of women in the field, the history, the statistics or the lack thereof. All I knew was that I wanted to be a conductor and I was gonna make it happen. And so as soon as I you know, started on that journey, I realized really quickly like, oh my God, this is gonna be difficult for, for me as a woman. But what mattered most was my passion and my yearning for it. And that's what kept me going. And so what I would say is just follow your passion, you know, because if you're really passionate about something, it's gonna drive you, it's gonna move you, no matter what you go through along the way through the journey. And, you know, when I, um, you know, climbing the ladder, you have to climb the ladder. I remember um, after I graduated from my master's program, I was gonna go to a school on the East Coast and start my DMA in orchestral conducting. But I got offered a job here in the Bay area as assistant conductor with uh, an orchestra and I got the job with the orchestra um, and the, it was they offered me a four-year contract uh, and the pay was two thousand dollars a year <laughs> oh. two thousand oh. dollars a year oh. right and so I was just like oh dear god the Bay Area two thousand dollars a year <laughs> my goodness 
Um, and so I had to make a choice. You know, um, I told the director, I was like, you know, I'm conflicted because I have a DMA offer. He's like, take 24 hours and we're going to call you back. And so I reached out to my friends and my mentors. What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? You know, academia and, you know, within four walls, learning about how to become a conductor or actually working and conducting as a professional conductor, but at $2,000 a year. Um, and so I decided to take the position um, and it was starting from, from the very, very bottom, you know, and, and slowly working my way up. And I had a hustle, you know, I, I told the director, I was like, I'll take one, you know, one year at a time. Um, I have a music education degree. You have to allow me to teach the Bridges to Music programs. Uh, give me an office position as well. Um, and then, make, you know, and guarantee that I'll get a raise every year if, if you are satisfied fight with my work he's like done I'm like done you know <laughs> so knowing how to negotiate for yourself to and advocate for yourself was um was something that I didn't learn in school but I had to learn you know in the moment um and and every day now to this day day how to advocate um, and, um for myself and for my organization and, and for my career mm. so advocate for yourself and go with your passion go with your passion yeah I mean I I I'm so struck by the 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 sort of purposeful pursuit right the the you know we at stanford um which obviously is known as a, a stem school um there one of the things that was so striking to me when i got there was just the realization that there are just artists everywhere they might be studying computer science or engineering or in the medical school but they are artists and many of them quite notably so whether they're students or faculty and so part of it is how we how we think of the institutions we have and how we reimagine and reinvent them so that we can better understand what it means for everyone to have a creative life. And your you know a a, role, a career in the arts could look like these careers but could also look like mine which is really different or could look very different we can't even imagine it because we're in the 21st century so it's that kind of like thinking out of the box and really realizing that every organization needs artists um, and we need arts organizations that are being very responsive to our communities so that's super inspiring um, I think I have maybe two more questions um, and and one of them is oh, maybe it's a little tactical um, or practical uh, and that it's it's related to your work lives, your work environments. If you could change one thing, what would it be? And maybe we'll start with Tamara, since she's new. <laughs> I would love to find a way to have a work-life balance in the performing arts. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very important for women. And I think that's why also there's less women in uh, executive positions and less women choreographers because that's a traveling itinerant job yeah. and if you have a family that's very challenging yeah. um, it's challenging for me um, I think it's challenging for all the ballerinas all the lead ballerinas I had in English National Ballet the principal ballerinas they were all mothers yeah. and we change our practice in how we cast it, in how we toured, to accommodate for the needs of families. But it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, and so I think for me, if we were able to somehow find a healthier working uh, structure somehow, I think that will help in terms of retention and the growth of leadership of women <clears throat> and choreographers and you know directors, repetitors, all of it within the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Danielle, do you wanna? Sure, I would love for everyone involved, uh, and I'll speak only to San Francisco Ballet where we are current, where I am currently, we are currently. Um, I wish that there was more of an appetite for risk truthfully. Because I do think everyone's like, we want change. We want everything to change, change, change. But don't change A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I really think the idea of risk, and it's actually, if we don't fail on something, that means we're actually not trying enough new things. And so I um, enjoy a little failure, but not all people have, have the same appetite for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the combination of those two answers and the fact that you two are the leaders is very exciting, right? Like the kind of change in the way we think about work-life balance and what structures we have and what risks we take, it's exciting. 
you know, poised to help lead the way. It's very exciting. Jessica? Oh, God. Oh, wow. I mean, with the SFL, you know, I created it. So I created an environment that I envisioned for myself, for women, for POCs, you know, to, to feel comfortable and welcome. And I, you know, creating that energy and sharing that energy with my musicians um, has been there since day one. So I'm, I'm really comfortable and proud of the orchestra that I created. And I love when my musicians and guest soloists, I've gotten a lot of my guest soloists from the ballet orchestra. <laughs> um, you know, they, they talk about how like, wow, like your orchestra has this really incredible energy of community um, and togetherness. And it's not about ego. It's always about the music, you know, um, and the experience of community music making. And I love that. I absolutely absolutely love that. So I'm going to carry on with, with that kind of environment uh, um, that I've created with the SFL that we've all, that we all created. It's a collective energy that we're creating. Um, one thing that, that, that I do want to work on um, with the San Francisco Philharmonic is funding. We need a lot of funding. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, um, when I first started this orchestra, um, I paid for the entire first set out of my own pocket, out of my savings account. And you know, it was an investment because I believed in myself and I believed in what I was going to create. And it was like the best, you know, um, investment I've ever made with my money and now the orchestra is starting to take off on its own we have a few donors and a few grants and, and you know it's it's on the on the up and up um, but it takes time it takes credibility and it takes community to really uphold all of our organizations financially musically and whatnot so um, as far as not changing the environment but building on the environment is uh, the funding is one of the big things that we're working on excellent excellent Priscilla Ditto on funding, I think. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask, is there anyone that would know? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and we, we really don't do any funding at all, believe it or not. And we do everything on a shoestring. We have a virtual office. We get all of our operations technology donated through our, far, through our 501c3. And we're very nimble. We're full of ideas. <laughs> but, you know, there's certain ideas that cost money. You know, for example, we have opportunities to exhibit overseas, you know, with other feminist organizations. Wouldn't it be great to be able to have enough money to be able to ship the artwork there and back? You know, that sort of things. So I would say that, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way our organization is right now and how nimble we are and how effective we are in problem solving. It would be great to have funding to do those really pie in the sky projects. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, the last question to bring us home so we can get to the wine um, will be uh, a combination of a question that I was uh, going to ask and a, maybe a better version of this question from an audience member. So my question was, what is your vision for the near future for your organization, for you, for the arts? The question from our audience member, and I'm just going to read part of it, is what do you want to bring with you through the pandemic portal into the future? Oh. So let's just go down the line this time. So we'll start with Danielle. Um, the empathy and understanding that people had, and I think there was, uh, or there maybe still is, and certainly some people in some places, a uh, time that you don't bring your full self to work, you kind of hide it and you kind of su you suffer through work or do your job, and then you can be your full self outside. But in the pandemic, I think um, the challenges were so great. They were just so great. And people were more aware of others. I think they had more time to be aware of others. Um, so that would be really nice. Like the kindness factor is nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that would be what I would like. Great. Yeah. Tamara. Um, I think for the art form, um, the opportunities that digital brought uh, were mind-boggling uh, of reaching people all over the world. Yeah. And I think we've now gone back to uh, live performance, which I love, and it's absolutely, I agree with Danielle, it's, nothing is like live performance, but we've gone also back to the limitations of, you know, recording cost this much and yeah. sharing cost this much and there's all these rules and and I, I I wish we had understood that sometimes the value of things is not just monetary, that there is a value on sharing the art form with people that cannot leave their homes for a myriad of reasons or that they are too far and that and there is not not everything can be translated into a monetary value. And that I, I, I wish we had found a way to continue to have mm -hmm. that flexibility. That's great, yeah. Priscilla. I think what we learned through the pandemic is how important community is. 
and how people want to stay connected, people want to find their own tribe and have an opportunity to help shape that community in a way that's more welcoming and more you know, caring. Um, as far as my vision is concerned, you know, I feel like there's a huge void in the art collection world on feminist art. We've curated a lot of significant feminist exhibitions of artists throughout the United States and even from overseas. And so we know who the amazing, exciting artists are, but there right now is a huge void in the world of collecting feminist activist work. And I would love to help fill that void. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Jessica. Um, so for me, you know, I've always been passionate about music, you know, day one when I was, you know, nine, nine years old. And so when the pandemic happened and to have it taken away, to have my love and my passion taken away was just, it was just kind of like going through the stages of grief, like, like really like denial and, you know, depression, whatever the stages are, it was just like, oh my God, I can't believe it's gone. Will it ever come back? Oh my God, panic. But then when it slowly started coming back, me and, and my musicians and I, I believe many artists, you know, had this, you know, at least for me, I, I'll speak for myself, had this like more profound love, you know, for, for the art and the fact that we have it back, you know, and, and just this tenacity, like, I'm not gonna let you go, please don't ever leave me again. You know, it's that saying where, you know, um, if you let it go and if it comes back to you, it's meant to be our true love. So that's the way I feel about music, like it came back, you know, and so I'm treating it with even more love, you know, even more care, even more respect, you know, that I, I thought I had like so much for it, but I have even more and more and more for it. Um, so I just love um, that me and, and the musicians that I've been working with um, embrace music in this beautiful, beautiful way, um, you know, coming out of this horrible storm of the pandemic. Uh, what do I wish as far as, you know, uh, the, the future? I want to see more female conductors on podiums, period, you know, um, opera, ballet, you know, the, the symphony. I want to see more women, you know, um, conduct and being leaders in these different arts organizations. Um, and also, you know, female performers, um, you know, uh, San Francisco Philharmonic, our next concert is May 6th at the Herbst Theater, 7.30 p.m. Um, and we're performing um, the Brahms Double Concerto. And I'm so excited that our soloists, our violin soloists and our cello soloists are both women. Um, and so it's, it's just beautiful to have two female, you know, artists up in front of the stage with a female conductor and a very diverse orchestra uh, really representing this music. And, and, and I, I, I wish for more of that to happen across the board. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Well, it has been an absolute honor, pleasure, and inspiration to be able to be in conversation with you. I know that I feel hopeful, and I feel like there is an incredible amount of opportunity, especially when we know that we have these leaders in the mix. So thank you all for this beautiful conversation and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Deborah.